then would deny that for what the policeman said is true describes a particular state of affairs in which a particular entity, the policeman's statement, has a particular property, truth. So neither Frege, nor Strasser, nor Ramsey would interpret this uh, sentence as if it were predicating a, a property of an entity. So, in general, all of them would deny that the logical analysis of Paul could be done in the way in which we usually uh, do the interpretation of a sentence like five. The car is red. Okay? So, the point is that uh, people, people think, I mean, philosophers of, uh, of language during the, the 20th century uh, have defended that if you don't interpret this sentence, what the policeman said is true, using the same semantic apparatus that we use to interpret this one, the car is red, then you are not allowed to say that the first sentence is true or false, because only under this uh, kind of interpretation, a sentence is true or false. Okay, this is uh, what I mean is that uh, the simple point, and now you know that I think it's false, but the simple point is that truth is essentially linked to description, to describing how things are. And this is reminiscent of the correspondence theory of truth, and I think it's wrong. But this is what is behind the frege gitch argument, okay? So, what Frege does, uh, uh, this is intentional, so I, <laughs> it just, uh, I, I don't want to explain it. It's just that Frege said that uh, in order to, under to understand his point, uh, sorry, Frege, no, Gitch said that in order to understand his point, we, uh, we should uh, understand the distinction that Frege uh, made between asserting of something, uh, asserting P of something and predicating P of, of something. Hmm? So here the, uh, here the text in which uh, Gitch uh, introduced his criticism. And in fact, this is the only thing that he says. So it's, it's not easy to understand what he really meant, even though everybody now uh, speaks of the frege Gitch argument as if it were something obvious. Well, it hasn't been obvious to me. So what, Fre what Gitch says is, one could not write off such uses of the term as calling for a different explanation from the use, from their use to call things uh, true or bad, for that would mean that arguments of the pattern, if X is true, if W is bad, then P, but X is true, W is bad, ergo P, contain a fallacy of equivocation, whereas they are in fact clearly valid. So Gitch's idea is that if you think that uh, ascribing true, uh, truth to a content is not describing anything, then it follows that you are not allowed to use arguments of this kind because if you, if you did it, you were committing the fallacy of equivocation. So I will try to uh, analyze how uh, the fallacy comes in. Okay, two descriptive arguments. Uh, Gitch seems to say that so imagine that we have this kind of argument. X is true. If X, if X is true, then P, second premise, X is true, conclusion, P. Uh, this idea is, if in the second premise, X is true, we were, we were not describing, then the kind of content of premise two couldn't be the same content as is uh, as is placed in the antecedent of the conditional. 
I will explain the reason. So, the the fallacy goes in the fall. Um, this is the, the the argument. So, let me explain the fallacy. What he thinks is a fallacy, better. So, in the first premise, the idea is that logical notions are, in fact, truth functions. So, premise one is a conditional. Conditionals are truth functions, and the argument has to be truth bearers. From this follows that, at least in the antecedent of a conditional, a truth ascription has a descriptive use and not merely an ascriptive one, on pain or of informedness. Here, we call the proposition true. This is uh, the Freudian distinction that uh, is irrelevant here. So, the idea is, given that the conditional is a truth function, it cannot be true that the antecedent <coughs> is not a description. Because if, it's, if it were not a description, then the condition as a, as a whole would be ill-formed. <coughs> okay? So, uh, we assume that logical notions are truth functions, which I accept. But second, what I have called the solvent property. The solvent property. Kitsch's point is that in premise two, if a scriptivist where right, no description would be performed but merely an ascription. Ascriptions are not the kind of act that can bear truth, and thus they cannot trigger the application of modus ponens, and here we are merely predicating truth of, pro of the proposition. This is, the, again, the Freudian distinction. Okay, so, and third, the fallacy. Therefore, the semantic entity in the antecedent of the conditional and the semantic entity in premise two cannot be the same entity, which is what the modus ponens requires. This is why it would be a fallacy if ascriptivists were right. Okay? This is what everybody understands uh, understands um, under the Frege Gitch argument. Well, As I see it, to uh, to, uh, so to assume, or uh, yeah, to to understand this argument as fallacious, you need to add to it two further assumptions that, as I see them, are unwarranted. The two further assumptions that we should add to the argument in order for it to be fallacious are the force effect, look what I have called, the force effect and toxicity. What is the force effect? The force effect is the following idea. The intuition that the pragmatic force of a speech act modifies the logical properties of its propositional code. Again, that the same content cannot be, cannot appear in a speech acts with different force. This is what, uh, what seems uh, to follow, or uh, it seems to be presupposed in the Frege Gitch argument, because what he says, he, uh, what uh, Gitch says, is that if you don't describe but merely ascribe, then the content of your speech act cannot be a truth better. Okay? So there seems to be something like what I have called the force effect. So the kind of speech act effect, uh, affect the logical properties of the content of the act. And second, toxicity. Toxicity is the intuition that a term which expresses meaning corrupts the conceptual content of any term in its surroundings. The idea is, if you think that truth, for instance, is not a descriptive term, then the conjoint occurrence 
of truth with some other terms, we uh, preclude the other one of having their proposition, their normal propositional content. Okay. But these two, what I'm going to uh, to uh, I, I'm, now I'm going to uh, argue, argue that this, these two presuppositions are false, and that all of us, in fact, know that they are false, which is the same problem I had with the liar paradox. So we sometimes use uh, we sometimes use some kind of argument whose presuppositions are obviously false and that we know that are false, but nevertheless, we continue using the same argument once and, uh, and again. So I will argue that the force effect is false and toxicity is false. And at the end, that if we don't have the force effect and toxicity, Gitch, uh, the Gitch, uh, Gitch's argument loses all its interest. So, first, uh, against the force effect, the same propositional content can be entertained, asserted, doubted, questioned. So this is what we understand by, by propositional content. So it's nothing uh, original that I'm saying here. I'm just reminding you of an obvious uh, thesis of the speech act theory. I can say, okay, yes, this is exactly what I'm saying, that he was not there that night. But I also, I can say, I wonder whether he was there that night. And also, I doubt that he was there that night. Yes, yeah, the, the kind of act, the force is different, but the propositional content is the, is the same. Okay? So, uh, let's go to the first premise. The first premise, uh, if X is true, then P, what it says is that uh, for it to be well formed, X has to designate a proposition, and P has to express a proposition. So you know uh, that uh, already. So some examples. If what she said is true, then Juan is a spy. If evolutionism is true, then human beings are part of the natural world. If that Victoria is again true, then she's also a human being. All of them are examples of this uh, structure. And, and you can see that uh, the, the expression, which is in the, in the place of X, has to be a term with a, con, uh, with a complete propositional content. So expressions uh, such as what she said, evolutionism, and that Victoria is a girl, are different kinds of propositional designators. So what the conditional does is making explicit, making explicit <coughs> the inferential connection between the proposition designated by the variable x and the proposition expressed by p. Okay? Why not? <laughs> if, uh, if, if, if we wanted the second part, we would just write if x then p. No, because x doesn't have the appropriate gra grammatical category. You cannot say if evolutionism, then human beings are blah, 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 blah. So it's just a grammatical question. Is that the way or the way after well, this is in. No, 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 no. Who? No. If X is true, then P. Is this is this is uh, his example. X cannot be a sentence because if it were, this expression would be ill-formed. It's true. It's a grammatical predicate. 
exactly. It's, it's an A. It's, it's a nominalization of a proposition. Okay, but this, uh, this is just a grammatical fact. Nothing, nothing more interesting. Okay, so let me. <laughs> What I'm saying, this is me uh, speaking, not Peach. What I'm, what I think is that, okay, if we analyze Gitch's argument, okay, X has to refer, so X has be uh, has to be a a nominal variable, but the kind of terms that can be that can uh, be substituted by the X uh, have to be terms. With a complete propositional content, otherwise this uh, this <coughs> sentence in the antecedent would be ill-formed. I cannot say John is true. I have to say evolutionism is true. Okay. So X is a designation of a proposition, and P has to be a propositional content, a complete <coughs> propositional content, because conditionals are truth functions. If conditionals are truth functions, then the antecedent and the consequent have to be truth bearers. This is obvious, isn't it? Okay, so what does the conditional do? The conditional only makes explicit a particular kind of relationship between the content designated in the, in the antecedent and the content expressed in the consequent. This is what conditional uh, what conditionals uh, do. So the acts in which the antecedent of these conditionals are uttered can or cannot uh, be descriptions depending on your favorite theory of truth without the pragmatic category affecting their propositional code. This is my point. The logical relation expressed by conditionals is not established between linguistic items, a singular term and a sentence, nor between speech acts, an ascription and a description. The logical relation is established between their propositional content. Again, uh, it, so, uh, Gitch's argument is that here, in the antecedent of the conditional, we have to have a description because we need a truth better in order to the conditional to be well formed. What I'm saying is we don't need a description. We need some kind of propositional content. But that propositional content doesn't need to be the content of a descriptive act. It can be the content of any other kind of a speech act. Okay? So, the propositional content in the condition of antecedent and in premise two are the same. Independent, independently of the kind of act. Okay? So, again, the frege argument, as everybody understands it, is that if truth ascriptions were not descriptions, then this kind of movement, this kind of inferential movement, would be a case of the fallacy of equivocation. What I'm saying is, in order for them to be right, they have to assume something like what I have called the forced effect. So something, some thesis in the sense that the force of a speech act affects the logical properties of its content. But this is unwarranted. Okay? So you can say, you can assume that X is true, is not a description without assuming that it doesn't have a propositional call. It doesn't have a propositional content. Okay? But what I have called the forced effect is not explicitly assumed 
by anybody. It's something that is presupposed. Uh, so, the conclusion of this uh, uh, part is the pragmatic status of an act of ascribing truth, be it an ascription, a description, or an assertion, doesn't destroy its propositional content, which is the argument of the truth conditional logical notion. Okay? Put it differently. Logical notions need truth bearers as the arguments, but they don't need the arguments to be put forward as true. The relations, so when you, when you draw an inference, you use the content of the propositions that you are using as premises, but you don't, you don't need to assert your premises. You don't need to assert your premises. You need to assert your premises if what you want at the end is a proof, but not if what you want is to have an inference. An inference is just a kind of movement in which you make explicit the consequences of some uh, propositional content. Okay? And in fact, in the antecedent of conditional, Propositions are not asserted, are only conditionally entertained, okay? And, and then, uh, now uh, go to the second assumption. The second assumption is toxicity, something that I, I explained yesterday from another, a, a different point of view. So what I call uh, toxicity is uh, this idea. The standard truth conditional understanding of conditionals poses a difficulty to those views that uh, reject that truth ascriptions have a propositional content. But, so, uh, the, uh, the idea is um, what everybody understands when they use uh, the frege kitsch argument is that the classical understanding of truth conditions so the standard interpretation of conditionals uh, is uh, incompatible with the idea that truth ascriptions are not descriptions. Okay? So what I, what I want to say, or what I want to defend now is that to sustain this incompatibility, you have to add a further thesis which is T5. T5 is the occurrence of an expressive term in an utterance dissolves the utterance's propositional content. This is what I, I call toxicity. So, but T5 is a bold semantic claim. And as far as I know, nobody has defended it explicitly. But it seems to be needed in order to draw the conclusion of the frege gitsch argument. So, according to a semantic position characterized by C1, C2, and, and C3, functions of propositions don't contribute anything to the lectern. So, functions of propositions, truth, for instance, or knowledge, or conditionals. Uh, by the way, but still, functions of propositions are functions of propositions. That is, the fact. So, in the in the semantic, uh, uh, how can I say? In the semantic uh, view that I'm defending here, we have both things. We have that some concepts uh, don't have a descriptive use. For instance, truth is not a descriptive concept, or knowledge, or I don't know, or conditionals. Uh, they don't have a, a representationalist meaning, which means that they don't, they cannot be used to describe how things are because they are higher order. But at the same time, 
by definition, they are functions of propositions. So they have, uh, they have by definition, a propositional core. They indicate diverse uh, operations on the lexon while maintaining it unaltered. So toxicity is incompatible with, with, uh, uh, with many positions about higher order concept that say that they don't contribute a component, they don't have a descriptive use, but at the same time, the arguments are complete propositions. So the defendable intuition, somebody might think, okay, so how is it possible if it is uh, so obvious that, it, that T5 is false, that people have assumed something like it in order to accept the frege gitsch argument? My explanation is that Uh, that the defendable intuition that might lend some support to T5 is a version, an incorrect version of the principle of compositionality that uh, everybody attributes wrongly to Frege. And the version is that one. The version is if a sentence is, if one of a sentence's components lacks reference, then the sentence as a whole lacks reference too. But the reference of a sentence is, according to Frege, a truth value. So the idea is, if we have in a sentence a term which don't have, which doesn't have descriptive meaning, or that doesn't contribute, that doesn't have descriptive meaning, means that it doesn't have a reference without a reference, then the sentence as a, as a whole lacks truth value too. And this is because an application of the principle of compositionality. So T6 uh, has been widely supported to the extent that a version of it has been baptized as the platitude principle of semantics by Margaret Conrad. So the principle of compositionality has been baptized as the, uh, the platitude uh, principle of semantics. But as, so, as I see it, nobody has explicitly uh, defended uh, toxicity, so T5. As I'm trying to show you that the air of triviality that people uh, uh, attribute to T5 is because they are confusing it with T6, which is <coughs> trivial for some people. Okay? But if we, if we defended toxicity, so if we defended the idea that the occurrence of a non referential term in a sentence would destroy the sentence's reference then would uh, uh, preclude the sentence having a truth value, then this would imply that syncategorematic term, any kind of syncategorematic term, for, in, for instance, uh, uh, logical notions, would dissolve the contribution of categoremata. Nobody has explicitly defended this thesis. So in fact, so to show that uh, T5 and T6 are different theses, uh, uh, one can stick to T6, which is the principle of compositionality. I think that the principle of, of compositionality is false. But OK, you can stick to it. It's OK. But uh, to show that T6, uh, which is the principle of compositionality, and T5, which is, uh, with, uh, which is what I have called toxicity, are different theses, we can see that Frege accepts the first one and rejects the second one in the same text. Here is the, uh, the Frege text. If I assert it is true that seawater is salt, I assert the same thing as if I assert seawater is salt. This, this enables us to recognize that the assertion is not to be found 
in the word true, but in the assertoric force with which the sentence is uttered. And he says, this may lead us to think that the word true has no sense at all, but in that case, a sentence in which true occurs as a predicate would have no sense either. All one can say is, the word true has a sense that contributes nothing. Preges word. The word true has a sense that contributes nothing to the sense of the whole sentence in which it occurs as a predicate. Okay? So, my conclusion is, the Frederick argument has seemed to be an obvious refutation of expressivism in general, but nevertheless, to remove expressivism from the semantic de debate, we must do better. And thank you. <laughs> Adriano. <laughs> no, 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 what I mean is that, I mean, uh, it's, uh, it's quite annoying that uh, every time that you present something like expressivism about truth or about how, how um, higher order concept, somebody says, okay, but you can't say so because the Frege Gitch argument implies that blah, 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 blah. Okay, the Frege Gitch argument is a, re a ready made weapon against any kind of expressivism in general. But the frege gitch argument is absurd because it uh, relies on two assumptions that nobody uh, assumes, nobody accepts. And accepting them, for instance, accepting uh, toxicity would mean that you have to, uh, to assume that every, ta every time you use a syncategorematic term, you are destroying the propositional content of the speech act in which you are involved, which is quite obviously don't happen. Obviously, it doesn't happen. Okay? So this is my point. My point is, the Frege Gitch argument is, all, is obviously um, fallacious, even though everybody uses it. No? Yeah? No, I'm just going to digest. Uh, <laughs> can I, can I speak then? Then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It, it, does, it doesn't require, it doesn't require either force or truth. No? Why not? We, we don't, each doesn't say that you destroy the propositional content when no. you put it in a sentence like that, right? It just, it just, uh, it, neither does it destroy the content, nor does it modify the content. But if you put notion, semantic notions and couple them with propositions, the most you can uh, accuse each of doing is that he assumes that putting notions like that creates a new proposition. It doesn't destroy the first one, it just creates a new one. Mm -hmm. If you say, for example, B is true, X is true, that's different than just stating the proposition I found in which is true. Okay. Why? Because you can also say X is false. Yeah, and but... that is a different proposition. So in order to have any any intuitive grasp on why truth and falsity are different things, we need to be able to uh, um, first put forward P and then deny it. Yeah, but if you it's assume it's, it's what I was trying to do, to make the point I was trying to make yesterday, you lose falsity if you assume that all, all you do with truth ascription is putting forward propositions. You, you that's don't not know. only that, sorry. Uh, okay. <laughs> that's not the only thing you do, because you want to be able to, to, to ascribe falsity as well. Yes. So if you're just saying, well, the only thing I do is putting forward the proposition, then you cannot say P is false. Why not? Because you, you're putting forward the proposition. I and then, I and then what? Well, Maybe putting forward is not the, the right uh, way of saying it. But the idea is, uh, when I say, so if I say P, I'm, I don't know, putting forward a content. If I say P 
he is true, as I say, the only thing I'm doing is explicitly uh, addressing attention to, so explicitly saying, okay, I endorse this content. If I say P is false, I'm putting forward a proposition, but not as true. I'm, you know, so I'm saying, okay, look at this proposition. I don't endorse this. But one thing is, I mean, this is uh, quite, uh, um, A proposition, the content stroke, and the judgment stroke. What Flegel says is, you have a proposition of content, you can either entertain in it, say, look, the proposition that the Greeks uh, uh, I don't know, uh, or the, the Persians were defeated by the Greeks in Plati. Right? Okay. The proposition that I'm not getting committed to anything about this proposition. I'm just saying, okay, look, this is the the content stroke. I can do something else with the proposition. I can get committed to its consequences. How? saying, okay, I'm asserting it. So, with the content stroke, you put forward a proposition, but not as true. You just say, okay, look, this is a propositional content, but I, I, I'm, I'm not committed to it. I'm committed to it when I assert it. So, there are two different moves. Yes. Yeah, but but, you're not using the, the Greek series, uh, it is neither in conversation, neither in pragmatics. If you want to buy all of the Greek series, the uh, thematic apparatus, yeah, I, I you won't. have to buy all the Phrygian positions. Why? Well, I'm, and then you have to show me how to do proofs, logical proofs. And it's notoriously hard to do it. You know, no, no, no. Exactly like I, I buy so almost everything in Phrygian. I mean, didn't you change stuff under the Greek series? So people say, but I don't be. But I don't believe it. I don't. I don't think so. People say so. People say that there are two phrases because in the same sense in, the, in which they are two Wittgenstein and two I don't know, two Kant and three Hegel. So I don't know, but or infinite Hegel. I don't think so. I think that Frege said the same thing from the beginning to the, uh, till the end. But I buy almost everything that Frege said. So, and uh, the idea is, one thing is, so, uh, in, 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 for instance, in, I can have, so the same propositional content can be the content of, a, of an assertive speech act, but also of a doubt. I have used here, can I, wait a minute, please. Uh, exactly, so, here we have three different uh, speech uh, acts. The first one is an assertion. This is exactly what I'm saying, that he was not there that night. Here, I'm getting, I'm getting committed to the content. So from here, from six, it follows that, as I see it, that he was not uh, there that night is true. But in seven, I wonder whether he was there that night. The content is exactly the same, the propositional content. But because this act is not an assertion, from it, it doesn't follow. I, I'm not allowed from this to go to the next step, which is, he was there that night, was true. I can't, I can't say that, because I'm not entitled. And the same here, I doubt that he was there that night. Okay, okay. The propositional content is exactly the same, but because the speech act is different, I'm not allowed to the second step of attributing truth to it. So, 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 yeah, so wait a minute. So, one thing is putting a proposition forward, or, I mean, or, or explain it in another, I mean, probably it's not the, the, the best way of saying it, I don't know. So, but using a proposition in a particular speech act, and another thing is 
asserting the proposition and then being able to ascribe uh, to ascribe truth to it. Okay. So no, no. I, I mean, the, so you, I can't. You say, you say that then you ascribe truth. Sorry. I can ascribe truth to a so content. You say and then you ascribe truth. Yes. Yes, of course. So truth ascription. Truth ascriptions. Almost nothing. This is what I'm trying to explain. <laughs> I'm not saying that. No, no, not different. Then I do one, and then I do the other. So by doing one, I'm not doing the other. So I what is the extra thing I'm doing? What I'm doing when I uh, apply truth to a content is making explicit the assertive character of my speech act, nothing else. This is why I'm defending that truth is expressive. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't add a new conceptual component. Truth is linked to assertion. And it's a second order act. So. In a order. No, asserting when you assert, I when you are an act of assertion is saying P. No, no, but but uh, so asserting something. I both things. I can't. I can't. Yeah, because I can't see the difference. How not? So what? What? Uh, what? Um, uh, Gitch is saying is that this is the fallacy of equivocation. If you are an expressivist, what I'm saying is to prove or to have different entities in the second premise and in the in the and in the uh, antecedent of the conditional to have to add other principles that are not warranted at all. No, no, but uh, yeah, but uh, it's important. I mean, it's important. I don't think you have to add it look, premise one, X is, if X is true, it follows that P. Right? Yeah. And here's my premise. X is pretty, or X is doubted, or X can be doubted, right? And what? If you're right, the only thing the propositional form is uh, asserted in premise one and premise two. So I can follow and say P, but I can't. That's the whole point of logic. It, it doesn't suffice to entertain the proposition. It has to be true. That's uh, why if it's not true, you can't move. That's the, that's, that's the property of logic. And, uh, and, and well, yeah, the, the, this is the classical stuff. But the idea is: imagine that you say, uh, if uh, if uh, Brazil were a kingdom, then uh, it has uh, it has uh, it would have a king. What was the problem? I'm not saying that the antecedent is true. I'm just saying that. From the con from the content that some country is a kingdom, I can uh, draw the consequence that it has to possess a king or it has to have a king or a queen. And you don't need. I mean, this is. Uh, I I have I have used this uh, argument because it's a Gitch's argument. And. Uh, uh, his idea, as I understand it, I mean, and it, it, this is the classical way in which people uh, interpret uh, interpret uh, uh, Gitch, is that the fallacy of equivocation of which it speaks in his text is the following: that here you must have a description because uh, conditionals are truth functions, whereas in the second premise you don't have a description and uh, thus, you don't have truth bearers, which is, the, I mean, 
using these photos. <laughs> well, you, you, you join the majority of the philosophy of the language. Oh, language. No, not the majority. But. Yeah. No, I, I'm trying to, to uh, so let, let me try to, uh, to make both view compatible in a sense. What you are saying is that let's take, because the expressivist part, the expressive part of the expressivism is to say that, to say that is true is to endorse. Uh, and, and, and this is what should be wrong with expressivism, because expressivism would be not about a description of things, but of my approval of things. So in that case, we can see that more, more clearly. And what, what you are saying is the following. Uh, so let's remove it's true, because it's true interpreted in terms of expressivism would mean uh, I endorse it. But in order for the law, because I, I understood your point, uh, in order for the logic, for, for the argument to, to, to go, to, to, to function properly, we should have X is a fact, then P. Second, X is a fact, and then P. In, putting this way, we would uh, make easier to the audience to see that there is no expression of my endorsement is just like being pretty much objective. But, but, but Maria thinks if you say X is a fact, you won't So, so, but this is, this is okay. Maria and Frege, Maria and Gottlob. Okay, Maria and Gottlob. <laughs> Both think the same. From, from the riches and every other. Word. So no, so this is one part of the thing. So the the the, the Fred Gitch argument against expressivism is to say that so uh, the second premise cannot be about approval or disapproval because then the logical form wouldn't uh, work at all. Okay, and w what is uh, seems to be wrong with the Fred Gitch argument is that. I'm not using true again, I'm, because it's it's much more difficult to, uh, to to argue in these terms in terms of truth, because we always expect truth to be like is a fact. Me too, in both uh, Yes, is a fact. Uh, but when we are dealing with other kinds of judgments, like is good or it's bad, it's easier because we can easier uh, we can see easily that there might be some subjectivism in this, in this expression. When I said that uh, killing is bad, uh, it might express my reproval from, uh, of, of killing. So it's, it's easier. I see your point that you are putting truth more close to uh, good. good and than the other way around. So, and Frege, uh, yes. in the text that I, we, I, I used yesterday, so the, the point is, if you say killing is good or killing is bad, uh, expressivists think that this uh, speech act doesn't have a propositional content. And why not? Because the, the same thing can be expressed making explicit the propositional content. For instance, it is bad to kill people. Yes, and that's Killing the point. people is a proposition. Yes. So the, the propositional content is not destroyed. But let me let me try to finish because here is where, uh, so. Uh, and, and then if we we think about uh, good and bad, and the argument against expressivism is to say that. If you use X is bad, then P, and X is bad, uh, you can, it, w it wouldn't follow that P, because, of course, you are using different uh, uh, propositions, or whatever you, you want to say, in, this, in the premise one and premise two. That means that the, what is presupposed is, is the following. <laughs> now, this undermine, it should undermine the expressivist argument in the sense that 
we wouldn't, if you are an expressivist, you wouldn't be uh, able to derive the normativity of the conclusion from the premises. Why not? I have a modus ponens. Well, here is where perhaps we disagree, because he, I, I, I buy your interpretation of truth closer to, uh, to, to good. But if I buy this, I also have to buy that, of course, the normativity of the good-bad argument are not derived from the logical properties of this argument. In, law, in, in, in morality, that would be very interesting to, to say that it's not about... People act not because of the normativity of a rule does not uh, derived is not derivable from the uh, an argument or the justification of, of 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 this rule. There is something else we have to put in, in this conversation. So I, yeah, I can't buy. I, I can't have both things. This I understand. But if you bring truth closer to morality. In a not sense. closer to morality. Oh, no, truth. closer to good, no, no, no. good and bad. Truth is a higher order concept, like good. And what I mean is that, of course, if you have, if you have killing people, is bad. If killing people is bad, we should forbid the death penalty. Second premise, killing people is bad. Then we should forbid death penalty. There is nothing wrong in this argument because the, the conclusion follows not from having uh, applied wrong to a propositional content, but from the normativity included in the conditional. We are forgetting that conditionals are higher order concepts, and of course conditionals are norm normative concepts. If you assert a conditional, then you get committed to the consequent whenever you are prepared to assert the antecedent. And this is independent of the kind of content. So you can have a normative content or a descriptive one. Is it relevant? I don't know. So what I'm trying to say is when you use higher order concepts, for instance, truth, but also good or wrong, Killing so, people is bad. Okay. Does this uh, content uh, have uh, logical properties? My answer would be, of course, because it has a propositional core. And if I put it in a conditional, then I can draw some conclusions if, if I have the antecedent. But the normativity has nothing to do with the content. That would, be, would you agree with that as well? Yeah. If you have only the content, you wouldn't have, you can't have the normativity, con the normative consequence. You would have the, the, the content derivation, but not the normative part. What you are saying is that the normative part is, belongs to the assertion, this, not to the content. If you want to be normative, you have to focus on the assertion. If I have, if I have this content, and I entertain also this content, then from this doesn't follow this. Is this what you are saying? Exactly. Yes. But if you assert the premise and assert the second premise, then it follows. If I don't have the assertion, what I say is that the formal, the, uh, the logical form of the argument is valid. Whatever, you put, whatever content you put in, in it, uh, you will have a valid argument. The other thing is uh, the assertion of that, and of course, the normativity that derives from, from from it. So, if 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 P and Q were asserted, and we were to assert P, then we have to assert Q. Well, I don't know. Of course, you can. 
I cannot prove whatever I want. There's no, 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 but... Only answer is you will buy food. If you don't, then you cannot say it. No, uh, yeah. Uh, it's my entitlement. Yeah, but wait a minute. Uh, uh, I think that you you ran out of actual because, uh, and, and, and Professor Maria, because I, I think that, well, uh, it seems to me that Adriano is making a point that, uh, you know, uh, the ontological values are not called under the watchdog. Or like that. Because if you think about these kind of arguments, um, if I substitute premise to by X, he follows as well because from X is true, he follows that X, right? But it seems that Ariane is saying, well, from X is true, it follows that X, but from X is good, it doesn't follow that X. So it will not follow that P, right? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that what he's saying. And it also seems to me that what Professor Trapper is saying is not inconsistent with it, because it seems to me that she, she, she's endorsing a kind of uh, principle that says that uh, assertion or judgment, what is it, judgment, uh, is or can be called under entailment in this semantic sense, right? So if I substitute P by whatever Proposition, uh, even even if it mentions values or, or like that, the argument will, will will run as well. But that doesn't mean that uh, the the ontological value is called from that. Yes, I, I think I'm trying to say exactly that, and I don't think what you are saying is incompatible with no, no, what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to. to Yeah, because, but, because they can assert, no, but, as Basile, uh, we have to idea but, but uh, uh, yeah, the problem, one of the problems here probably is that the, your notion of assertion, assertion is not uttering words. You say, I can't assert everything I, I want. Okay, I can assert that today is right. Monday or that this is China. No, I mean. I can't say this word, but if I asserted it, uh, I mean, uh, uh, to, in order for me to assert them, so to assert this content, I should have some entitlement, which means some justification. And I don't have it, and I don't have them. I, I want to say some justification. As commitment. Said, no, commitment is what you acquire after having asserted. In order to assert, you have to have some entitlement. So you have to have enough position in which you really believe yes, the content right. of the speech act. So I can't assert everything. I, I mean, I can't assert now that we are immortal. Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah perfect, perfect, perfect. Yeah, if you are crazy, then, then from, of course there oh, are. Oh, there is. This is the point. If you really believe in that, and I disagree with you, and you are crazy, you will uh, fight with me, say, no, you are wrong, you are wrong. So if the normativity shows up, uh, appears, when you are not, uh, in, uh, you cannot accept that I'm not, we disagree. Uh, that, I am, that I disagree. So. so this is the point. But when we are discussing the logical form of the argument, it's no matter if, if whales fly, then yes. uh, birds eat meat. Whales fly, then birds would be, okay, we can assert in this sense anything, and the argument goes. And we, but we are not expecting you to buy the conclusion in terms of the assertiveness of the conclusion. You're, but if you, you assert the premises. Yes, in the, in the, in the, in the, in the. Of course. If you, if I imagine, but this is a, a, as I said, a basic principle of rationality. If I assert, uh, if today is Friday, then uh, we are going to go out for a drink. Today is Friday, then, well, no, I'm not going to go out for a drink. <coughs> what are you doing? So there is something wrong here. There's nothing wrong because... because 
But it's, it's the same thing. It's the it's same just, thing. No, this is where we disagree. You're hiding. Sorry? I don't You're think they are the same things. thing. Because if, if you both agree that those are the same thing, then you have problems. Because you are saying different things. Okay. But I don't think that they say it's the same thing. I think that, I mean, I'm, a, an, I'm an inferentialist, and I think that the, the rules of logic are dependent on the normativity of, of meaning. So I don't, I can't, in, so in, in, in my general picture, I cannot think that, I cannot think that logic is something that has nothing to do with normativity. I think that normativity is a basic feature of our system, of our conceptual system. And it is a basic feature because we use concepts, when we use our concepts, we are open to public correction. Yes. Full stop. So there are no different things. Of course, we can, we can cut these stories, in, in these, uh, these um, topics into parts to, in order to deal with them easily. But I don't think that logic goes uh, one way and then semantics and truth in some other way. I don't think so. My my primitive is meaning. Meaning. Uh, meaning and for everything that we do with words or concepts. My primitive is meaning, and I understand meaning in an inferentialist way. So I think that I can't say my daughter is a girl without accepting my daughter is a human being. And this is logic. Logic. This is what conditionals mean. Making explicit these connections is what conditional means, nothing else. Then, normativity. We are normative creatures. Because we are social creatures. Yeah. And because when we do things, not, we are always open to public correction. Okay. But not because we are logical beings or mm. rational beings. Mm. So I, 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 I think that, that, the, 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 that there is, I mean, I, there is no difference. No, yes, there is a difference. This is the point. The point is, if you are in this way, I would agree with you completely. Logic is not detached from the normative part. That is an abstraction of that. Yes, yeah. okay. I, I, I accept yes. that. But when we try to discuss, uh, I will use morality again, again because normativity is easily understood in these terms. Yeah. Uh, when they try to derive moral norms from uh, argumentation, we do exactly the opposite. We say, because this is a sound argument, you should accept this. No, but this is the uh, this is the descriptive fallacy. Of course not. Yes, exactly. uh, but of course not. I'm not committing the descriptive fallacy. No, no, I no, no, what, no. Yeah, what I mean is that, uh, of course, you cannot go from a, a, a kind of content to a kind of obligation. Of course not. What I'm saying is that if you if you uh, so if you are in, uh, involved in some kind of normative act. At the end of the day, this normativity, so you carry this normativity with you all the process long. So if you say, I mean, if, if you say, if, uh, if, uh, if uh, killing people were right, then we could kill the speaker. Yeah, so, but it doesn't mean that you should kill me now. It only meant so this was only allowed if you asserted the first conditional. Yes, but exactly this is the point I think with Frege uh, Frege 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 is that uh, expressing this is wrong, but he's saying uh, if you are expressing this, you are kind of subjecting this. And this is clearly nonsensical. Yes, yeah. but this is a... We show this with the help of this 
out of a day from here. So I buy the stock, but I have to buy as well that normativity doesn't come from the argumentation. So this is the part where I can understand what you're saying and say something that is against the faith of each argument. Oh, I accept what you are saying, but what you are saying is that normativity should come from this. Now, and I think it's compatible with what you are saying. Yeah, but uh, so the Frege-Gitch argument means that and if you don't think that you are describing, then what you are saying is something subjective. What I mean is, okay, maybe some kind, I mean, now I don't think, I don't even think so. Maybe some kind of expressivism is this way, but I don't even think that Wittgenstein uh, would buy this kind of expressivism. But for sure, the kind of expressivism I'm defending here is not a trial. What I'm saying is that you, some of our concepts are not descriptive without this means that we have to uh, renounce uh, to put forward propositional content with, when we use them. So this is the point. Okay? <laughs> well, it's a, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult story. <laughs> but you wanted it. <laughs> Get back to the same issue because I understand why Leo is comfortable with um, uh, some kind of uh, change. Uh, you know, we, we change true values for modes of expression, uh, and uh, th there is there is this. this uh, there is this behavior of rational creatures uh, that can be explained by the fact that in a large class of cases, uh, we behave logically, we, we follow uh, logical uh, rules. So, although I, I don't make uh, an explicit assertion of a certain propositions that follow from the things that I have already observed, there is this, this phenomenon that we observe in rational creatures. So, for example, let, let us suppose that I assert or believe or judge that New York is bigger than Fort Alegre and that Fort Alegre is bigger uh, than, than Granada. Uh, and, and I don't explicitly assert that New York is bigger than Granada. But if I, I get some uh, I watch or he hear someone saying that New York is not uh, bigger than Granada. I, I grab the person, and, and, and that means that in some sense I already judge before this moment. I already judge that uh, New York is bigger than than Granada, even though I didn't. Explicitly assert or or, or believe this, this proposition before, and part of the explanation why I I go through this this act of correcting my friends uh, is that I, I, I follow these this rules right. If A is bigger than B, B is bigger than C, then A is bigger is bigger than 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 C. And uh, but the point is that not th there is a whole class of argument types that we behave in accordance with. But there are other kinds of more complicated arguments that we do not even have the cognitive apparatus to follow or to behave in a in accordance with. So maybe you, you, you're supposed to say that, uh, well, what matters for, for pragmatic issues is, is these uh, types of schemas that every normal human being is disposed to reason in accordance with. And then we, we, we have a, a, a space to, to separate, you know, the conception that uh, um, truth values must must be 
different from from modes of version that I'm trying to make? No, for me, truth values are different from modes of, of assertion. And I don't, I, I wouldn't like to go too deep in this topic because it's complicated, but I don't have a logicist account of rationality. So I don't think that being rational means acting according to the laws of first order or second order logic. I think this is, I mean, otherwise, okay, well, I'm not going, I have said, I'm not going to go to this. Uh, so what I think is that uh, uh, the principle of, of rationality o only means, I mean, as I see, as I see it, the, the topic of rationality means that when I make an assertion, I get committed to public correction, and I'm, I mean, I, I'm willing to discuss the consequence, the consequences of what I'm saying. That's all, and this means that. When I use a concept, I'm endorsing everything that follows from it. And if I'm not aware of the way of things that follow from uh, that follow from it, somebody else can put it at, at, put uh, 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 his finger and say, "Okay, are you aware? So do you know that if you say black and black, blah and blah, blah, you are also accepting that I don't know." Black people are more intelligent than white people. Well, I, I haven't, I haven't, I didn't uh, think of it. But if you if you say that it follows, so wait a minute. And then, if I at the end of the day I I understand that this follows from what I have sa said, then I should retract my assertion. This is rationality. Yes. Yeah. This is a very good point because no, because I think this is uh, uh, in a certain sense against your your view. So let me give an example, and, and it might be very clear uh, because we connected the formal logic with the content immediately. So if you said uh, New York is bigger than than, than Porto Alegre and so on and so forth, but I can say well, an, an ant is bigger than a whale. A whale is bigger than a rat. So an ant is bigger than a rat. If you don't, of course, it's so absurd, you have to not pay attention to the content, only the formal uh, logic of, of the argument. And it follows, it's perfect, okay. But because we, we are so uh, confident in this formal logic, and we connect the content with, with the formal logic, that we think that it's possible that if I make you an argument and show that you are contradicting yourself, you have to change your position. And then I say, well, you see, you have to respect everybody. No. Or this is, uh, it, this is. some sort of, uh, let me make an argument. Uh, uh, human beings deserve to be respected. Uh, your neighbor is a human being. And your neighbor has just crashed your car, stole your wife, uh, <laughs> rob your money and whatever. Your neighbor has to be uh, uh, respected. Uh, can you see this? The consequence of this? Yes, and so you have to change your position. To hell with that. I'm not changing my position. I hate my neighbor. Yeah, <laughs> you hate your neighbor. You, you hate your neighbor and you are also not like irrational on that. No, 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 no. You, you, you have the. Uh, <laughs> No, meaning is not a premise. No, no, meaning is not a premise. A premise is a concept. Meaning is something that has to do with ling ling uh, linguistic items. What I mean is that if you say everybody deserves to be respected, and I say, but I hate my neighbor, then you are not being rational. Probably you. So, in my my conception of rationality, well, this is a, I mean, this is a non-monotonic consequence. So you can say, okay, everybody re and deserves uh, to be respected, except if they are bastards like my neighbor. Okay, then, okay. Of, co of course, this is perfect. But if you... <laughs> okay.
That's all. So thank you very much for having Highly controversial discussion. We <laughs> close this workshop. I thank you very much for your participation and for especially for Maria Frappoli's resistance <laughs> yeah. and energy Endure. and cleverness. And I hope we have you again. Well, hopefully. Um, well, it depends on if you if you stick treating me this way, you I'm won't not going come to again. So. <laughs> maybe I'm maybe not going maybe to come back. Some people like okay. To be well, yeah, but not me. I I, I much prefer to be. <laughs> okay, okay. So thank you very much. Thank you, Maria. Quiero una, quiero una